Okay, we might make a start. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we're here on the land of the Terrible and Jagera people um, and pay respects to their elders past and present and to any Indigenous people who are present. Um, always was and always will be uh, Aboriginal land. Um, my name's Tricia Ranald and I'm the convener of the Australian Fair Trade and Investment Network, which is a network of about 60 organisations in Australia which advocates for fair trade based on human rights, labour rights, and environmental sustainability. Um, I'd like to thank the Electrical Trades Union, Queensland Branch, for um, lending us these facilities to have this um, public forum on the um, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF. And in a moment, I'm going to give a general introduction to what IPEF is, and then we have four speakers uh, from uh, different parts of the world who are going to give their perspectives on IPEF. Um, so I might start, and I'll introduce them as they um, speak. So just to give you an idea, um, they are Melanie Foley, who's the Deputy Director of Public Citizen Global Trade Watch in the United States, Adam Wolfenden, who's the Trade Justice Campaigner for the Pacific Network on Globalisation, which involves Pacific Islands, and Jane Kelsey, who's an Emeritus Professor at the University of Auckland. But I'll start off with an overview um, and we'll get the slides up on the screen. IPEF is above all a United States initiative and it's part of the U United States economic and strategic rivalry with China in the region. The US is not a member of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which includes China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand and the 10 ASEAN countries. And it's not a member of the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, used to be called the TPP, of 11 Pacific Rim countries. And there is, in fact, bipartisan opposition in the US Congress to trade agreements that offer access for other countries to US markets. IPEF seeks to set US standards for trade and use US rather than Chinese supply chains without offering any more access to US markets. So there are no direct trade gains for Australia or others. And IPEF also claims to establish high standards on labour and environment, but so far there's been little consultation with unions and community groups or with parliaments. Now, secrecy versus transparency. Our government has a policy for a more transparent process for trade agreements, including access to the actual negotiating texts. And unions and community groups were invited to make presentations to the negotiators at the negotiations that are going on today in Brisbane. But Australia and I sorry, Australia and other IPEF countries have signed secrecy agreements with the US, pledging to keep all negotiating documents secret until after five years after the negotiations. They'll release the documents only after they've been signed, but we can't see what is being negotiated at the time it is being negotiated. This is a one-way street. We can talk to them, but we can't know or comment on detailed proposals being made during the negotiation. So that really limits the quality of the consultation. Now, if we look at what is being negotiated, what we know so far, what they've published are the negotiating objectives. So, um, and they're calling them the four pillars. So the first one is trade in agriculture, digital trade, labour and environment standards. And it's not clear, but apparently they intend some of these to be binding. 
Second one is supply chains between IFPEF partners, trying to create supply chains that are less dependent on China. The third one is called clean economy, and that involves cooperation on clean energy and technologies to reduce carbon emissions, and apparently will involve investment in joint projects to achieve those goals. And a fair, the last one is the fair economy, which is about corruption and tax evasion. But as I said, what's not clear here is how enforceable these agreements will be. They're talking about some in Pillar 1 being enforceable, but not so much for the others. And with the joint projects with private companies, there's questions about how they will actually be agreed by governments and then carried out by private companies in terms of transparency and accountability. Um, this is a bit like the China uh, Belt and Road project. F has a diverse membership and interests, so it's not going to be an easy negotiation. In IPEF, you have US, Japan and South Korea, who all have a shared commitment to neoliberal trade model and countering Chinese economic and, and strategic influence in the region. India is a key US ally, but has some economic interests separate from the neoliberal model, particularly on digital trade. And India is not in the CPTPP or the RCP and not in the IPEF trade pillar. They have opted out of that pillar. Seven of the 10 ASEAN countries, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam, you can see there that there's very different levels of economic development and trade with China. Um, some of them have a lot of trade with China, and four of these are in the CPTPP and they're all in the RCEP. Then we have Australia and New Zealand, which are both high-income countries and US allies, but China is their latest, largest trading partner, and both are in those other two major trade agreements. And then we have Fiji, which is in a unique situation because it's a small Pacific island economy in the context of growing Chinese influence in the Pacific. It's not in those large trade agreements and it has very um, important issues about development and also climate change with rising sea levels. The other thing about IPEF is the extent to which business organisations and transnational corporations are directly involved. So usually these corporations do have a big influence on um, binding trade agreements between governments, and they include big tech, services, agribusiness, big pharma, manufacturing, fossil fuels. Um, and they're a strong influence on what we call traditional or binding trade agreements between governments. But the agreements are actually between governments. But in IPEF, these um, groups and corporations may have even more influence because the IPEF model isn't offering market access in return for the adoption of US standards. So these investment projects involving particular industries and companies will be very important in um, offering um, their, these projects to um, the governments involved in IPEF as incentives, but the accountability for them is not clear. Um, these corporations are, are separate from governments and they will operate on their own terms. So, for example, we've already had big tech companies offering training to women in developing countries in the region, but it's not clear whether the training will be specific to each company and therefore can't really be used outside the context of that company's software or other uh, rules, or whether the skills will be transferable. In other words, it'll be a general training in digital skills, which can be transferable 
both for the person um, and for the economy as a whole. And obviously, transferable training is preferable both for the person and the economy as a whole. The other issue about IPEF is the geopolitical and strategic issues and its impact on peace and regional stability. So Australia is a US ally, but China is still Australia's largest export market. The government's policy is for stronger ties with ASEAN, a regional order in which all states can contribute to a strategic equilibrium rather than be forced to choose sides. This was a statement from recently from Senator Penny Wong, Australian Foreign Minister. The government also wants to keep talking with China to ease China's trade restrictions on Australia, and we've recently seen that some talks have been resumed. Now, just before announcing the IPEF goals, the US introduced its own new trade restrictions against China <clears throat> with a ban on US exports associated with computer chips and secondary restrictions for other countries. In other words, their penalties if they export the same sort of components uh, associated with computer chips. And those countries include IPEF members like Singapore and South Korea. So the US in that instance is having stronger restrictions on relationships with China. Singapore's Prime Minister recently responded to that by saying that greater decoupling between the US and China may result in less economic cooperation and less interdependency, less trust, and possibly ultimately a less stable world. So we all, as civil society organisations, have a community interest in peace and stability in the region and we want trade arrangements like IPEF to contribute to that and not exacerbate instability and uh, geopolitical tensions. So if we look at what issues arise out of APEC for civil society groups to be concerned about or campaign around, the secrecy agreement means consultation is a one-way street and limits our participation. Um, there's an issue about the dominance of business groups and cooperation in process and content and how accountable their projects will be. There's also the issue of negative impacts on workers, small farmers, women and Indigenous community of other aspects of IPEF, like deregulation of corporate investment, digital trade deregulation, and other speakers are going to analyse these issues. There's the lack of enforceability of human rights, labour rights, and environmental sustainability. And um, to sum up, what we're saying is the Australian government should implement its policies on transparency, enforceable labour, and environment standards and regional stability. And that is just some information about AFTINET and our links, links to our IPEF campaign page and where you can donate or join. Thank you. So I'd like now to introduce Melanie Foley who's the Deputy Director of Public Citizen Global Trade Watch in the United States, and she's going to give us perspective on uh, civil society organisations in the United States on IPEF. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Pat. So Public Citizen is a US consumer advocacy organisation with half a million members and supporters. And because, as Pat said, the IPEF is a US initiative, I think it's helpful to know a little bit of the US political context surrounding it. So we are potentially in a new era of US trade policy because after decades of civil society and unions in the US and around the world campaigning, um, both main US political parties to varying degrees 
acknowledge that the harms caused by traditional corporate driven free trade agreements have to end. And these include offshoring good paying union jobs to countries with weaker labor standards that allow companies to pollute with impunity and creating a race to the bottom. So the top U.S. trade person, U.S. trade representative Catherine Tai, says that this administration will not be repeating the mistakes of past MTAs, but will be creating a new worker-centered model for trade. At the same time, the administration is facing a lot of pressure from Republicans and new liberal Democrats to either rejoin the TPP or do something comparable in the region. Hence, we get IPEP. So this IPEP may end up being kind of a test case for what Biden's idea is of workers for trade and what that looks like. And to give credit where it's due, it is a big deal that IPEP so far is not supposed to have an uh, investor state dispute settlement system or ISDS, which empowers companies to sue governments over laws they don't like and yet taxpayer compensation. It also won't have the intellectual property rules that make medicines out of reach for people who need them. But we don't know yet what terms will be in the agreement. And the process so far does raise some red flags. So because this is not an FTA, meaning it doesn't include market access or tariffs, the administration claims that it doesn't have to go through Congress. Now, this is disputed by many members of Congress from both political parties, including a large block of senators on the committee that deals with trade. Under past FTAs, which did have to go through Congress, there was a set of rules requiring consultation with Congress, notice before a final deal, hearings, stakeholder engagement, and all of this was completely insufficient, unsatisfactory, but it was something, and now even all those rules are out the window because this is not an FTA. So at this stage, no one really knows what this thing is, what will be in it, or how or if any of it will be enforced. Uh, one thing we do know for sure is that the tech industry wants uh, some binding rules for this, and we know that because they've said this quite plainly in their submissions to the U.S. government. They want rules that would limit governments from regulating online platforms in the interest of workers, consumers, or smaller business competitors. So there is some reason to hope that this could be something different, but that will only happen if the people who will live with the results of this deal demand to be included in the shaping of it. Okay, I'd like to now introduce our second speaker, Adam Wolfenden, who's the trade justice campaigner with the Pacific um, Network on Globalization. So. Thanks, Pat, and thanks everyone. Uh, so I work for the Pacific Network on Globalization and PANG, as it's known, and PANG is the Pacific Islands Regional Network that works to promote self-determination and economic justice in the Pacific Islands. Um, so I guess I'm here partly because CG is, is uh, had mentioned a negotiating party to the IPF, um, one of the small island developing states, um, and you know it. So it it's has, now has this seat at this uh, problematic negotiation, and part of the reason CG is there is because you know there is a very heavy geopolitical angle to to this agreement and these negotiations, you know, um, IPF is very much considered a US-led response to China's sort of in, encroaching influence in not only just the Pacific Island countries, but, you know, this, this broader concept of the Indo-Pacific. And this aim of, you know, this harmonization of the economic and regulatory systems is very much about, you know, bringing, bringing other countries into the US system. And I think we need to understand that it's it's a security agreement, you know, by and large. And you know, partly it's it is this economic security angle. It's also this bringing in, you know, bringing into the fold countries and, and aligning them more closely with the US 
uh, approach in the newest systems. And so it's, you know, we would argue that it's a security issue as opposed to a development agreement, which, you know, obviously the way they try and sell it is it's development, it's different, it's not a trade deal. And, you know, you, you have to read the real politic in, in the, like the genesis of the actual agreement. Um, across the Pacific, even this, this security framing of, you know, IPEF, Indo-Pacific, it's something that isn't particularly well received, even though Fiji is a member. Um, you know, it's, it's very much external framing placed upon on Pacific Islands. And we saw this rebuff quite strongly when Samoa's Prime Minister, you know, when asked about the concept and the term of, of the Indo-Pacific, that that's someone else's narrative. And, and that's a really, you know, like the fact that a Prime Minister has basically pushed back so strongly on the conceptualization of the Pacific is indicative of the way that not only the IPEF has been presented as this, you know, this regional response to China, but also the way that that's leaving out a lot of countries that have just been, you know, either in it or out of it and how that responds to their relationship with China. For some of the Pacific Island countries, the export, like the economic interests with the US aren't really apparent. Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga are the only ones, you know, who have a, uh, apart from the compact states up north, that have like a significant export interest um, to the US. But as has been discussed by others, this isn't about market access for other countries into the US. It's about market you know, regulatory harmonization with what the US is, is wanting. And that's very much you know, in a small number of states that have limited resources, limited manufacturing capacity at the moment. This is a burden. This isn't about expanding their ability to trade with the US. It's about them being better able to have US companies or US exports come into their countries. And so again, we're not seeing this, it's not a sense of development, we're seeing it to, um, you know, essentially the US staking out more and more ground, you know, in this case within Fiji, but we, we know that there's pressure for other particular countries to get on board. We saw that with the Biden meeting with Pacific Island leaders. A lot of the language, a lot of the goals from that meeting, sorry, with the Pacific leaders, is, is very similar to what's been contained in the IPF ministerial statement. So there's a lot, they're pushing for that synergy and I imagine hopeful inclusion of other Pacific Island countries within IPF. Um, and, and, you know, and then this has become problematic because you're having a railroading of these countries into a Pacific, into a specific type of regulatory system, regulatory framing. And that cuts down the options they have to, to explore you know, different options with other countries. Like we see with digital trade, the, you know, there are op options. It doesn't just have to be the US sort of led Facebook, Google, Amazon approach to the internet. There's, there's a lot of different ways that this can be explored. And, and mechanisms like the IPF really start to undermine that. Uh, the other issue is around climate change. Uh, the IPF, you know, again, it's branding itself as something different. They have the space to do things differently. But it seems to keep coming back to this idea that trade legalization, you know, the market will solve the issues of, of climate change. And, you know, this idea around, um, you know, financing green investments, creating environmental goods and services, it, it largely misses the point because the reason we are dealing with the climate emergency and climate crisis is that the major partners within IPF are responsible for it, but then they're kind of saying we want a level playing field where we can all trade our goods and services together. And that ignores A, their responsibility, and B, the fact that they have already got that technology and they are the best place to use that to access other markets. Um, you know, whereas, and I think other, the response we'd have to that is IPF should be addressing this issue, but in a completely different way, the way that, you know, ensures that tech transfer, and ensures that there's an ability for other countries to develop these industries, and not just leading it to this, Sort of whim of the market and, and hope that everything um, will we'll kind of work out if, if left you know, unencumbered by government. Uh, I, I think 
what the sort of time, maybe I'll just wrap up here in re reiterating some of the comments that have previously been made around the process for the IPF going forward and the need for access, access to the documents, access to negotiators. It's, you know, this idea that they, they want this 21st century agreement. It's not like the old FDAs. And, you know, this is one way to start that process by saying, okay, here, we'll, here's the documents. Here's what we're discussing while we're discussing it. And I think it's very much vision now where IPEC is still being formulated and there is scope for us to engage it and intervene and to try and shape it into and put things on the table that we want. Um, whether or not they get taken up, we can have that fight later, but I think that's, we're in, in a unique position and I think forums like this, you know, start those conversations and we need to, to keep going. So thanks. For and I'll introduce our final speaker, who's an Emeritus Professor Jane Bosley from the University of Auckland. Thanks, John. Thank you, Pat. Uh, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Tamil the, the traditional custodians of these lands, the Tuvalu and Chabra people, the elders, past, present, and future, and recognize that they have never ceded their sovereignty. Um, one of the funny things that happened in the last couple of days in the first negotiation that's happening in Brisbane as we speak, is the number of delegations who have said directly to me, what is this thing? And these are people sitting in the negotiating room who are negotiating something that can potentially have real consequences and they don't have any idea what this thing is. And that's a bit scary, especially because this thing is not on its own. As we heard, it's a part of a strategy by the US, but not just for the so-called rebranded Indo-Pacific, because we're not going to have Asia in there anymore, because Asia means China, but it's actually labeled the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity as part of the new kind of branding exercises that we have around FTAs to say they're not like the old corporate deals. But it's only one of a number of similar US outreaches. So in the Latin America, we've got the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, or APEP. And if you look at the pillars on APEP, they're almost identical to IPEP. And then, as Adam mentioned, by the host of Pacific leaders, and we had a new Pacific Partnership strategy, which has a kind of toned down version of the same IP of things. And right now, this very day, Biden is meeting African leaders to talk about re cementing the relationship um, that has got rather fractured. Now, obviously, this is, as Pat has said, about the geopolitical, geostrategic, hegemonic battle between China and this. But it's also about the rebranding of the deeply unpopular trade agreements of the past. But the idea is running very far ahead of the actual planning of both the process and the content of the agreement. And even in the US, they haven't been able to agree because the first pillar, the trade pillar, has been run by the US Trade Representative's Office. And the second, third, and fourth pillars, um, dealing with supply chains, clean economy, and tax and corruption, are being run by the Ministry of Commerce, and they've got their own internal divisions. Um, and so you have to wonder how they're going to pull this off. And there is absolutely no doubt, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement before it, that this is a US-driven process, but it's even more obsessively US-driven than the TPPA was. Not only did the US dream up the idea, it dictated the four pillars, 
it has total control of the documents at this stage. And the reason why there are the security gaps are that the members of the negotiations were told they couldn't access the documents unless they signed this security agreement that is even more extensive than the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's setting the timelines. It's setting the negotiating agenda for each round. Even before the stakeholder session was agreed to here with Australia hosting, the US had to consent to it. The US is chairing every committee except the one on inclusivity, which rather suggests that that's not their priority. Um, and it is drafting the points for discussion, including the texts that will be up for discussion. So the question is, what are our governments doing this for? They don't even know what they're negotiating. The US is dictating the terms. It's a mess. One of the strategies is to have the US more involved in the Pacific. But it's also, I think, the problem that many of our governments, having been on this carousel of trade agreements and trade negotiations for many years, no agreement left behind. And so they're, they're going along with and cooperating with the US, which has its own internal agendas as well as its own external agendas. But the US is also the host of APEC in 2020s. And lo and behold, if you look at the theme that was just announced at the recent APEC leaders meeting, it is creating a resilient and sustainable future for all to drive forward work on key issues such as supply chain resilience, digital trade, connectivity, opportunities for SMEs, climate change, environmental sustainability, digitalization, women's economic empowerment, anti-corruption. So it is the IPEP, APEP agenda. And so you can expect that the timelines for IPEP are going to be tightly tied to the US timelines for APEC and seeking to have some deliverables along the way. But how on earth are you going to do it, given the mess that IPF is, is really hard to tell. Of course, whilst the US talks about us being different, the US corporate lobbyists have been reinventing themselves as a, an American association of the Indo-Pacific, um, which is the same old corporate lobby friends we've had in the past, and who are running through uh, with the same agenda that they've had in the past. So the, the main corporate players who are sponsoring the American Association of the Indo-Pacific are PayPal. Johnson & Johnson, interestingly, even though uh, IP isn't explicitly there, and private equity investor KKR. And they have, of course, already publicly said we want you to put on the table the best parts of the TPP, the um, US MCA, and that's what we want you to use as the basis for the um, for negotiations. And we heard at the stakeholders this week from the stakeholders today as well, Amazon, City, Services Coalition, same old agenda. And at the very core of it was digital, 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 whether it was city, was finance, whether it was Amazon doing its thing. I mean, it was, it is all about digital. Being sold as being a benefit to smaller medium enterprises, they're really concerned about SMEs, a benefit to the Pacific, um, and even a benefit to dealing with issues like the climate crisis. And so there is lots of writing that you can access about what the digital agenda is. But just basically think of who gets to control data, where they get to control data, and to choose under which country's rules the data is being held, their ability to maximize the uh, 
the consolidation and the processing and the utilization of data, including for their algorithms and source codes. Being able to operate from outside countries, which means not under your laws, but also uh, to be able to evade the kind of regulatory frameworks that countries are slowly beginning to see they need. Preferences for voluntary codes, uh, which means that just like the so Christchurch call, um, if they if, if Twitter allows to the, the Christchurch mosque massacre videos up there, oh sorry, we we will take it down and we won't do it again. And and so the protections there are simply not going to be in place. Similar issues around source codes, algorithms, artificial intelligence, and so on. So forget about effective human rights, labor rights, indigenous rights, anti-competition, um, controls on advertising, controls on political abuses uh, of data, um, of facial recognition, software, etc. And so this matters. And, and so I just want to close by saying, if this is such a mess, and if our governments don't know what they're doing and the negotiators don't know what they're doing, do we really need to worry about it? Yes, we do need to worry about it because there is a huge amount at stake. And if we are not vigilant, then it is going to be hosted through by uh, our governments alongside the US and it is going to become reality before we have any chance to get it. Yeah, thanks very much, Jane.